question for you. What must I do to be saved? In a country filled with so many different teachings on Christianity, this question can quickly become confusing. If you ask 100 different people, you could easily get 100 different answers. But which one is the right one? Only God's inspired word can truly give us the right answer. So, what must I do to be saved? Let's take a copy of it this morning and let's look together in Acts chapter number 16. If you want to look in the Bible or get one of your electronic devices, we're going to be studying a topic that is very vital in our relationship with the Father. It's in relationship to our Savior because as just was noted on the, the brief film there, the video for just a moment, that you can ask a lot of individuals and you'll get a lot of different answers. But the truth is, there is one place that we can go and say, God, what would you have us to do to be saved? I don't want to know what Wayne Miller says. I want to know what Lance says about it. I want to know, God, what have you told us in your inspired, holy, divine, inerrant word that would instruct us in the pathway of righteousness, that would bring to us a relationship of salvation? And I don't know of any place to go other than God's holy word. You know, there's a lot of great questions in this world in which you and I live. I mean, honestly, there's many serious, serious questions that would confront every serious-minded individual. I mean, when I think about great questions, honestly, folks, I think about, I wonder how long our country can survive in the midst of her tremendous debt. I don't know if you ever think about that, but when I read that we're some, our nation is some 19 trillion, trillion is with a T. You know, I can't wrap my mind around a million with an M, much less a, a billion with a B, but a trillion dollars with a T? Since I can't wrap my mind around that, I did a little research this past couple of weeks, and I found what a trillion dollars is like. In fact, I heard this from a congressman. He said to our Congress, do you guys realize how much a trillion dollars would really be like? And of course, like us, they probably said, no, I don't have a clue. Here it is. You could spend one million dollars a day and it would take you almost 3,000 years to spend a trillion dollars. And our nation... 19 trillion dollars. I often wonder, and a great question that I ask, how are we going to survive with those type of numbers? How can we handle our debt? And then a serious question. What about the future of cancer? Many of us in this auditorium, our lives and our families have been touched by that terrible, difficult disease. In fact, stats are now showing two out of every five individuals will have some type of cancer in their lifetime. Just a few weeks ago, I got a call from a brother in Christ in another location that I've been friends with for years. And he said, Wayne, I just got back from the doctor and he said, I heard that C word. He couldn't even say it, ladies and gentlemen. He said, I got the word about the C word in my lungs. I just wonder sometimes, and I ask myself the question, do you think we'll have a cure for cancer? And I wonder sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, do you think there will be a time that maybe we will have a, some type of vaccine like we did a few years ago with, with polio? I don't know about you, that's a serious question to me. And I wonder, I question sometimes, will there ever be another world war And if there were to be with so much discussion about nuclear weapons, what would happen if there is? You see, folks, there's a lot of serious questions that you and I could talk. And we could talk about these and bring up questions for the next hour or two or even three. But I would suggest to us that the greatest question of all, I'm talking about the supreme question, because I can't ask a greater question than he's asked. In fact, in Acts chapter 16, in verse 30, you have your Bibles? 
Look at the greatest question, the supreme question of all that has ever been asked. And it says, And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Before we analyze that question, extremely important, have you ever thought about who asked that question? Who is this individual that says to them, Paul, Silas, who is the individual that said, what must I do to be saved? Because that's the supreme question of all. That's the most important question that will be ever, ever asked by anyone at any time in any given place. This is it. So who is this individual? Well, if you go back and do a little research, what you're going to find, what we know about this man is Acts chapter 16 in our text. Now, Philippian jailer most likely would have been a, a Roman soldier in the past. Probably moved to the Roman colony of Philippi. And now he is in this trusted and understand very important role of serving as a jailer. This job of, of being a jailer. It would be given to an individual of, of great strength. It would have been an individual that would have been willing and able, even if, if brutality, when it would be necessary. Because he has all kinds of people in that jail that's been put there for a number of reasons. For murders and etc. Robbing. They were criminals. So he has a very important job. He has great strength. He has a great sense of obligation. He has to be a responsible individual. And he has to have his blind allegiance to Rome. Have you ever had anyone, have you ever said to anyone, i tell you what, man, you've got it made. You've got a good job. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to one of our guys at church. He's thinking about retiring. And I asked him, I said, when are you going to retire? And he said, oh, maybe September, October. And I said, really? I said, I'm surprised. He said, why? I said, because, man, you've got it made. I mean, you've got a job like tasting pie in a pie factory. That's a pretty good job, isn't it? I would like to have a job tasting ice cream. In an ice cream factory. You know, I told this guy, I said, man, why would you leave a job like that? I mean, it's a wonderful job. You've got it made. You know what a lot of people would have said this, man? Man, you've got a good job. You, you got it good as a jailer. So now let's analyze this question. Let's analyze it by just noticing very simply four parts of this question. First of all, when I look at this question, there's a, a got to. There's a got to. And that is, what must? When I see the word what must, that says to me, I've got to. He knew, this jailer, knew there was a requirement for his life. And he understood, even though he was in a good position, that the needs of his soul has not yet been completed. Did you notice in that question, what must? He didn't say, Hey, what can? Or, this is what I'm going to do, guys. Let me tell you. Paul, Silas, let me tell you what I'm, I'm going to do. He didn't say what must, what can, or, or you know, I, I think I'll just kind of do this if it's okay with you. This man said a very thing, important thing when he said, what must? He says, you know what? I've got to. I've got to. There's no way around it. He knew there was something Mandatory. There was something necessary. This man understood there was something essential if he were going to be saved. Now, have you ever read this account and wondered, how did he come to that conclusion? He's a Roman jailer. How did he come to the conclusion that something needed to be done? Something was essential. Something was absolutely necessary and mandatory for him to be saved. Well, there's two or three possibilities. First of all, you know, the gospel had just come to that region in the last few days. When you go back and look in Acts chapter 16 earlier. But you know, uh, we had a great study this morning by Lance in our Bible class on, on Acts chapter 17. And he noted a passage in uh, Acts 17 verse 24 through 28 about the fact that God Almighty has created every individual with a void and with, a, uh, with an opening in their heart and in their life that we are to seek Him. That we are His offspring. And the truth is that we've just been created that way. Maybe that was part of it. But also, I just wonder sometimes, when I go back and I see this, this Roman jailer, nothing about God, nothing about the Savior. 
If he might have heard this girl back in Acts chapter 16, verse 17. This girl that followed Paul and us cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Can you imagine this girl that that the spirit of divination and she's traveling around walking behind and she's going, these men right here, these fellas, let me tell you something about them. And this is what she said. They are servants of the Most High God. That's who these folks are. And no doubt many individuals, according to the Word of God says, many individuals heard because she said that for many days. Maybe he was one of those individuals that heard that message from her. There was some way that he's been informed and no doubt it made an impact when Paul and Silas were cast into jail, into prison. Look at it in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. When they were arrested, when they were beaten by many stripes, and they were placed in this man's prison under his watch, under his guard, they did a most unusual thing. What did they do? They were singing and they were praying and they were singing hymns unto God. Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you they weren't singing the blues. They weren't singing, oh, how sorry I am for myself. No, they were singing praises unto Jehovah God. And as they were singing praises, obviously, these individuals, this jailer specifically, took note. He made note of that. And then the Lord, isn't our Lord great? Isn't He wonderful? Because notice what the Lord did. The Lord in verse 26 Suddenly the Lord sent a miraculously targeted earthquake to that prison. The Lord sent that. Because notice in verse 26, there was suddenly a great earthquake, the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. The Lord God Almighty sent this targeted earthquake to that prison. And notice the result. In verse 27, in the keeper of the prison, the jailer, he knows he's in trouble, awakening from sleep. Any of you folks ever slept on the job? You don't have to answer that. But let me tell you something. This fellow was sleeping on the job. And awakened by this earthquake, he noticed he has a problem. At least in his mind, he's got a problem. Supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself. Why in the world would he do that? Because he knew that if his prisoners were gone, they would take his life. It was under his watch. It was his responsibility. So therefore he said, I'm not going through that. Have you looked at the word supposedly there? Ladies and gentlemen, there have been times in your life when you thought something was this way, but it actually was not. That's what happens to him. See, he thought everybody would have run, wouldn't you? I mean, if I'd have been the jailer, I would have concluded, you know what? Here I was asleep, earthquake came, all the doors open. Oh, man. Because, you know, they weren't in the Super 8 hotel. They weren't in a Hampton Inn. They were in prison. Filth, insect infested, prison cell. Likelihood, most of them was looking for a way to escape, to get out. So he thought, well, opportunity was there. I'm sure they have taken advantage of that. But notice what happened. The Apostle Paul stops him from taking his own life. But Paul said or called or cried with a loud voice, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. No one's left. No one's escaped. Your job and your life is secure. You're safe. There's nothing for you to be concerned about. And Paul stops him from taking his own life. And notice what the jailer does in verse 29. He called for a light. He ran in. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. In other words, all of this behavior and this action, he drops to his knees right in front of them and he says, I've got to. 
I've got to. I don't know what you guys have, but I want some of that. I don't know about this peace that you have and how in the world you can sing praises unto God and pray to the Father while you're in a prison cell. I don't know what I'm missing. I'm missing something and I've got to have it. I want it. I don't fully understand it. But whatever you have, I want. And then, notice the second part of the question. What must I, I want to, I this man, Roman jailer, he knew, he understood this was personal. No one else was going to do this for him. It was his responsibility. He didn't say, hey, well, you know, I know this fellow. I know this guy that used to be a jailer here. No. I, hey, let me talk to you about, about the thief on the cross. I, you know, I don't know about. No. He said, I got to want to do this. It's about me. What must I do? I'm going to be honest with you folks. When I read that question, what must I, to Paul and to Silas by this jailer, I wonder, do you think it was a possibility the Apostle Paul, when this question was asked by the jailer, he thought back to a very, very special day in his own life when he was asked a very similar question back in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. You remember then, known as Saul of Tarsus, a devout Jewish leader, thought that all who believed in Jesus Christ should be silenced and even exterminated. And on a journey on the road to Damascus, the Lord appeared, appeared to him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice and it cried out to Saul saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this? And then in Acts chapter 9 in verse 6, listen to the response. Listen to the reaction to those stunning events. Trembling and astonished. Saul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? When this jailer asked, what, do you, what must I do? Do you think Paul's mind went back to that event on the road to Damascus when he was told, go into the city and it will be told there what you must do? Folks, I would suggest to us this morning there's a difference in got to and want to. Some of us have projects around the house that we keep saying what? I've got to get to that. I've I got to get that done. I, I, I've got to, you know, I've got to take care of that. But there's a difference when you say, I want to do that. There's a difference in this man when he says, what must, and he says, what must I? He goes from a got to, to a want to. And then he says, what must I do? Now it's a move to. It's action. There's something that's got to occur. So he goes from, hmm, yeah, I, I got to do something. Oh, I want to. Now let's talk about the action of moving it. Let's talk about the action now of, of moving to. Unfortunately, and sad to say, this poor heathen man, a jailer, knew more about that salvation in Christ than a lot of modern day theologians. Today we hear things like, well, don't you know salvation is not... Man, salvation is something you get. It's not what you do. Because if you do anything, then you're really not, you're, 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 you know, it's a matter of grace. It's a matter of grace, and you know what it is, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. That, that salvation is a gift, and that if you and I do anything, we offset grace. Then all of a sudden, if we, if we do anything, we, we earn it, we, we deserve it. Oh, no. The Word of God still says in Matthew 7, 21, from the lips of our Lord, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Even Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why would an individual call me Lord, Lord, and not do the thing, what did you say? And not do the things which I've said. James says in James chapter 1, in verse 22, And why would you not be Doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doers. 
It's still a gift. If I were to say this morning, Lance, don't get your hopes up. Illustration only. Lance, if you will get up, uncross your arms, get up, come over here and shake my hand, I'll give you $500,000. Yeah, he'd be smiling. Look at him. <laughs> Let's suppose that happened. Lance comes over here. He does exactly that. He uncrosses. He stands up. He walks over here. He shakes my hand. And he turns around to you as an audience and said, Look what I've earned. Look what I have deserved. I... I should have gotten this because I walked 25 steps over here to do that. And you would go, he's out of his mind. He didn't deserve that. It was a gift. All he did was met the stipulations to come over here and receive your gift. Brothers and sisters in Christ, understand. When we do what Jesus says to do the way Jesus says to do it, it does not offset His marvelous, wondrous grace. It is still a gift. Salvation is a gift from Almighty God. And our faith in action, our doing, is accepting that gracious gift. And I wonder today why on this God's green earth an individual say, here's a person that responds to the gospel. They respond to the love of Almighty God. They confess Jesus is Lord. And I want to be baptized in the water grave of baptism to wash away the old man of sin, to be raised to walk in a new creation. In the light of God Almighty, I want to do that. And somebody says, oh, you deserve it. You've earned it. Oh, no, folks. God's gift of salvation is a marvelous gift by His wondrous, marvelous grace. And when we do what God says do, we do not offset His marvelous grace. It's a receiving of the gift that He's offered unto us. Now, concentrate on what he did. Let's concentrate on what he was told to do in verse 31. So they said, now remember the scene. He's come in. He's fallen to his knees before them. He cries out this greatest, the most supreme question ever asked by any person, any place, at any time. What must I do to be saved? And he says, what must I do? And they say to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That answer, it is not surprising to me. In fact, it is consistent with what Jesus has already said in John 8, 24. Except a man believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. So this is response that is very consistent with the teachings of our Lord. Anyway, you know, here's a heathen man, a jailer. He doesn't know anything about the, about the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. He doesn't know about the prophecies of the Old Testament. He's a heathen man. And he is told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, does the Word of God, is verse 31 the intent, the answer of Paul and Silas to be the end of the story? Why no, because look at the very next verse. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. Why did they do that? Because, brethren, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Here's a Roman jailer, heathen man. He falls down and he says, what must I do? And Paul and Silas said, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man would go, who is that? <laughs> who, is, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is He? And they said in verse 32, let me tell you about him. They spoke the word of the Lord unto him. Who is this man? Let me instruct you and tell you about this individual. Brethren, faith, faith is built on specific information. And where there is no information, there is no faith. The do part of this question is related detailed to him in the message that is shared in verse 32 when he says, and they spoke the word of the Lord unto him. Well, how do we know that? Because we moved into the fourth stage. We've gone from a got to, to a want to, to a moving, an action. Now it's into, to be saved. What must I do to be saved? You know, honestly, 
one of the scariest words in the English language to me is the word lost. I don't know about you, but one of the scariest words in the English language is the word lost. Have you ever been lost? I mean literally been lost? I can only remember once or twice of me being actually lost, having no clue which way to turn or where to go. And I don't know if you've ever been there, folks, but I'm going to tell you something. It was a scary feeling for me. Several years ago, Debbie and I, we'd taken our family down to uh, visit Mickey Mouse. You know, he lives in Orlando. He has this big, big mansion down there called Disney. And we wanted to go see him and, and Minnie. Pretty goofy, right? <laughs> so we're there. We're having a good time. And all of a sudden, we hear a small child screaming in utter terror. Not because this little fellow was scared of a ride, but because he had lost his mother and father. And there was panic city around all of those around him. Because here's this little fellow in dreamland, in a place where there is happiness, where it just abounds. And this little fellow was literally scared to death. You know why? Lost. Lost. Separated from his mother and his father. The man in Acts 16 had asked the greatest question that's ever been asked was an individual that was lost. And he says, what must I do? They said, believe them in the Lord Jesus Christ. They spoke the word of God to him. And in verse 33, they took him the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and his household were baptized. Why in the world of the action of verse 33? Why the action of verse 33? That action is they took him and his household and they baptized them. Because that was God's planned response of faith. That's God's, not, not Wayne's. That's God's plan of response of faith. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul had done in Acts 22 and verse 16. When he was instructed by Ananias, you remember? He was told to go, and you'll be told. Ananias came and told him, Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, call on the name of the Lord. Why in the world would you do that? Because it places you into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 26 and 27. For as many of you know that you've been baptized into Christ, you have been baptized into Him. It places you in the family of God, the church. Acts 2, verse 41 through 47. And yet today we still hear people say, do I really have to be baptized? Is it really important? Is, is that a salvation issue? I mean, do you, do you really think, preacher, that I need, that I should, that I must be baptized for the remission of my sins, I would ask you this question. Why do you, how do you think Paul would answer that question? It was asked. Paul asked it himself. What was he told? On the day of Pentecost, they asked the question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were told, Repent and be baptized. Household of Cornelius, a very good individual, was told to do the same. Lydia, later on in our chapter, was told to do the same. In other words, folks, what we're saying is that as you look into the Word of God, listen to what Jesus Himself said. Just take Jesus at His Word, Mark 16, verse 16, for He ascended back to the Father. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Just take Jesus at His Word. That's what we're looking at. We're not asking some man some opinion. We're just going into the Holy Word of God and say, Jesus, speak to us through your word. And Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And notice they did exactly that. And immediately the same hour of the night. Now, do you remember when Paul and Silas were singing hymns? What time was it? Midnight. Now, what time are we? Two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning? Because they spake the word of the Lord to him. Paul and Silas being preachers mean they spoke a long time. (laughs) 
We don't know what time it is, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. I know at midnight they were singing, and the earthquake came. He goes in, falls down, and they've instructed him in the way of the Lord, verse 32, and the same hour of the night they took him. Here's a question, folks. Please tell me, if baptism is not important, if, in, if baptism is not vital, would you tell me why on earth they chose to be baptized at the very same hour of the night before daylight? I mean, listen, he didn't have a baptistry in his home. Very unlikely he had a bathtub big enough to do it. It took some effort. I mean, if it's not important, let's get some sleep. <laughs> man, we've been up studying the Bible for four or five hours now, man. We've been studying. Whew, you've been speaking unto me the word of the Lord. I am, I am whipped. But you know what? I, I, you're right. I need to be baptized. I tell you what. What time? The next, uh, how about next week? How about next month? How about three months from now? Well, folks, if it's not important, it doesn't matter when. But if it is vital and it's important and it's a teaching of the Word of God, then we need to do it the same hour of the night. And that is exactly what he did with Paul and Silas. Why? Because what must I do to be saved is the greatest question that will ever be asked. And in verse 34, he went on his way rejoicing. He and his household. You know why? The old man of sin has been crucified. They washed away the sins called the name of the Lord. And now they've been raised to walk in a total newness of life in a relationship with Father. The truth is this morning, all of us individually, just like that man, what must I? It comes down to me individually. It comes down to you and your heart personally. What are we going to do with Jesus? We will accept Him, obey Him, or we reject Him and disobey Him. When you go into the Word of God, the Word of God tells us and instructs us and guides us what to do to have our sins washed away. And that is, submit yourself into the water grave of baptism to meet the very blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross to raise to walk in a newness of life. And the good news is, you can do that right now, this moment. Coming to Jesus to obey. Coming to Christ to have your sins washed away as you're baptized into Him to be a part of His church, a part of His family, as together we stand and we sing.